Hi guys, and welcome to part 2 of the 2012 Anniversary Edition Skyrim Mod Sanctuary. Now you may have noticed in part 1 that the mods we were looking at tended to focus on performance and user interface, the sort of user experience. The modding community was definitely held back by the fact that the creation kit had not quite arrived, but even by the new year of 2012, I began to notice more and more mods coming out that added content or changed major things in the game. Not just the user interface, not just performance, but the sort of things you would expect requiring the creation kit. Now, part 11 of Skyrim Mod Sanctuary is still one of my favourite uh, parts because it signalled a shift. It signalled a change in direction, um, not just in the mods that were coming out, but in what I was looking for from the mods. Um, the first mod that it covered was the Realistic Water Textures mod. Now, like quite a few mods for me, this is a mod that can actually ruin the game for you once you cannot have it. So if if you if you install this mod and you get used to it, if you uninstall it and go back to the vanilla game, you hate it. You hate the vanilla game. And this is one of those mods. The vanilla water is horrible. I mean, it really is quite atrocious. Uh, but I, I did not notice it until I had tried this mod out. Um, this mod really did make the water feel far more realistic um, and look a lot nicer. Now, this mod is actually no longer um, current, so to speak. You can find a link on the page actually suggesting you to go to um, another mod called Water. And that mod has a lot more features, uh, a lot more options, things like um, changing the way the, the water splashes, the rocks, the when they're wet. Um, I'm not even totally sure all the different options, uh, but it's a lot more current mod. I believe it was uh, rebuilt um, to be a lot uh, more stable, um, and it is the one I use, and it's the one I would recommend. But still, the original mod was a massive leap forward. And the other mod that was covered in that video was the Realistic Lighting Without Post Processing. And this was a big deal for me, this mod. Um, it, it, one of my major gripes with Skyrim is the lighting. Uh, when playing out at night in the vanilla game, you can see for miles. The sky is a funny pale blue, and they do desaturate everything and add a blue tint. But if you actually look in the distance, you can see as clearly as in the daytime. And the same is true if you go in dungeons. I mean, the dungeons were a little harder to see in, but in the vanilla game, you don't need a torch. You really don't need a torch anywhere. And this mod fixed that. I mean, those were the two major things for me. It made night dark, and you really needed either a night vision spell or a torch, and it made dungeons terrifying. I, I was taking a torch everywhere. I ended up getting very good at torch and sword combat. So I'd have a sword in one hand and torch in the other, and I would bash undead creatures and set fire to them, but I needed it to see because I didn't have night vision, which is absolutely brilliant. It, it really does change the way you play the game. This is especially true if you play a stealth character, because of course you don't want to be carrying a torch and announcing where you are, but you can't see everyone and where they are, which makes it a lot more interesting. Um, it also made the game look nicer during the day. Uh, the, the, the weather patterns just seemed a lot more interesting. I mean, it just made sunrises look so much better. And unlike the other uh, mods out there that changed light, which tended to be ENB mods, this had no post-processing and was pretty much performance neutral. It had no effect on your frame rate, or at least it didn't for me. So this was a superb mod for me. Now, this mod has also been discontinued um, and has been replaced by another mod called Realistic Lighting with Customization, which is a more advanced version of the same thing. And that is a mod I've also used and is equally as superb. Now, part 12 was my I Assassin video. And I made this one just as I was starting a, a an assassin playthrough. And the, the character was supposed to be a sort of duelist type assassin using long swords, long thin rapier type swords, and a small shield or an empty hand. 
Um, unfortunately, in Skyrim, there's very little uh, benefit to using an empty hand. So I'd usually end up with a torch or a shield, but I hated the shield options. So the mods that I, um, I covered in this video were absolutely superb for me. Now, the first mod was Jace's Swords. Now, Jace's Swords is a mod that just adds loads of weapons. It's not just swords, actually. It also adds axes, um, and they're really, really great. They're not just um, very fancy weapons. Some of them are very basic weapons, like woodchopper's axes, um, daggers. Um, but they're very believable weapons. They tend to be a lot thinner than the vanilla game weapons, which I like. So you get a lot of fencing type weapons, very, very elegant weapons. Even the two-handed swords seemed more elegant, but they weren't overly ornate or overly fancy. They really fit um, a Nordic environment very, very well indeed. And the second mod was the Buckler's mod. And this, this for me was a superb addition because it fixed the problem I had with the shields. It added the ability to craft buckler shields, very small shields, traditionally I believe used by mounted warriors, people on horseback, but great for an assassin type character. Very small shields, especially the ebony shield. Uh, they, they're very out of the way, but they allow you to block. They don't give you quite as much damage reduction as the big shields which is good, but you can still block with them very, very well, and they look great. So, I, I mean, I adored that mod. Now, the mod has actually grown and had a lot more different types of shields and even the ability to craft other armors. But for me, the core thing, the buckler shields, that was reason enough to get this mod installed. The third mod covered in that video was Arrowsmith Reupload, and... Basically, just a mod that allowed you to craft arrows, because believe it or not, when the game first came out, you could not craft arrows, which was really annoying, and you'd, you'd, have, you'd have all this ebony in your backpack, or wherever you kept it, but you couldn't make ebony arrows, and you'd always run out of arrows and end up using the weaker arrows, and it was so annoying, and this mod just let you craft, you know, you could craft, if you had the ebony for it, craft 150 ebony arrows and leave everything else behind and just use those arrows, which also look really good as well. Now, this mod is no longer needed if you're using the Dawnguard DLC. Um, actually, I'm not totally sure whether that's part of the Dawnguard DLC or was part of the patch that came with uh, Dawnguard. Actually, I'm not 100% sure about that. Perhaps you guys can tell me down, down below in the comments. But anyway, since that DLC, this mod's not really needed. And I also covered a mod called Better Archery Eagle Eye Perk. And it was just a simple mod that gave you more zoom when you use the Eagle Eye Perk. And I quite liked that when, using, uh, when doing archery. I'm not completely sure I'd use that anymore. Um, it's, uh, it was a little difficult to use archery close up when you had this perk because it zoomed in so much that it made, you know, if you were shooting someone at five and six meters, it was a little difficult. Now, part 13 was a video devoted to magic, um, and I covered a lot of mods in that video. And I was very, I mean, I was amazed by these mods because, again, the, at this point, at this video, we're still in January, the creation kit had not quite arrived. Now, the first mod covered was Balanced Magic. And I used this because I was doing a sort of a destruction-based mage playthrough, and destruction magic had issues, balance issues, as you gained in levels. And so this mod was a great way of making destruction a little bit more viable as you got higher, higher in level. Um, however, I believe it's probably been superseded by one of the many other magic overhauls that's out there, including things like Skyrim. Um, or um, Fendrix magic, etc. So I, I actually used this for an entire playthrough and I loved it, but it's probably now not so applicable. The second mod was Mage Friendly Dragon Priest Masks, and this was a very simple mod that took the three Dragon Priest Masks that were obviously aimed at um, wizards, magic users, and made them clothing. And the third mod, Warmer Magic Lights. This one was a godsend for me. 
Because I was using the uh, darker dungeons options in realistic lighting, for my mage playthrough especially, I wanted to use the candlelight spell. And I found the light to be very cold, very... Well, blue. <laughs> and actually wasn't all that useful. It didn't give off that much light. And with the warmer magic lights mod, it gave off far more light and it was a slightly nicer and warmer color. Um, now, if you're using the Claralux mod, this mod may not be as useful because Claralux does actually make light sources give off more light anyway. Now, the next two mods were the Staff of Magnus Improved, which was essentially a very simple retexture of the Staff of Magnus to make it look nicer, which it did, um, and is still useful now. Um, and the Staff of Magnus Absorb Fix. And what that did was fix, it depends on whether that word's the correct word to use, but it fixed the staff so it did in fact absorb Magicka and give it to you. Now there's a lot of argument as to whether or not the description actually meant that it absorbed it and gave it to you. Um, however, if it didn't, then it should have just damaged Magicka because that's all it did. And then that staff is very, very weak because there are staffs that, or staves, that will damage Magicka a lot more than the Staff of Magnus. If the Staff of Magnus is not actually absorbing it and giving it to you, it literally becomes a quest item only of very, very questionable use. So this mod makes it a powerful staff to have. Mod number six, Deadly Spell Impacts. This was a mod that replaced the little impact marks you got from spells like flame spells, ice spells, with far more realistic looking ones. Um, this, this is a great mod actually. And the last mod in that video was the Midas Magic Spells in Skyrim. Now, a lot of us remember Midas Magic very, very fondly. Uh, those of you who played Oblivion and played a wizard almost certainly will have used the Midas Magic mod. And this was not a mod that just extended the existing spell types like Fire and Ice, it added loads of new types of spells. Uh, plasma damage spells, for example, or uh, gravity well spells. There were all sorts of very interesting uh, spells to attack, but also some very useful spells, like the Open spell. Um, now this was a spell that was in Morrowind and Oblivion that would allow you to actually open locks, uh, using magic rather than lockpicks, um, and I really miss that spell. But it also added a really unique way of actually getting these spells. Instead of finding them or buying them, what you actually had to do was craft the spells in this special magical device, and you needed a lot of ingredients. Uh, I, I remember gold was uh, one of the key ingredients to all the spells, but it might be something like gold, a dwarven arrow, and something else, and that would make the open apprentice spell, that type of thing. And that was a really interesting idea, which really sort of helped make this mod stand out. All round, still a great mod, still well worth trying if you're doing a magic playthrough. Now, part 14 was a video I called A Wonderful World, and this video concentrated on mods that made the world look better, not by tweaking the lights, but actually making the physical world look better. And I started with the Enhanced Distance Terrain mod, and this was a very simple mod that improved textures of distant landscape. Um, and it's such a small mod, and yet it made a big difference when looking off to the horizon. Still very useful, still worth getting. And for me, it had no performance drop, so well worth trying. The second mod in that video was Skyrim HD 2K Textures. Now this is a hugely popular mod still, um, and it, it was a massive improvement over the vanilla textures at the time. Now since this mod came out, the, there was a sort of high definition pack released by Bethesda themselves, which were basically the original textures, only a lot higher definition. And they are an improvement over the, the old game. Uh, but if you're wondering whether it's still worth using Skyrim HD 2K textures, um, yeah, th those textures are actually better, generally speaking. They're, they do look a little higher definition to me. Um, some of them are a little bit more interesting as well. Um, they are different to the Bethesda vision though. So if you are a purist, 
using Bethesda's high definition textures is probably the way to go. Um, if you don't mind changing the look of a few things in only minor ways, then Skyrim HD 2K textures well worth using. And you can use it with the Bethesda HD textures. Um, it Basically, if you use this mod, it will use those textures that it has got, and any that it doesn't, you'll just use the normal Bethesda HD textures. So, still worth trying, still worth uh, installing. The third mod in that video was Skyrim Flora Overhaul, or Verts, as most of us know it. Um, I've used Verts mod in a few other games as well, and as soon as I saw it for Skyrim, I knew I was going to install it. It generally just makes the trees look higher definition, a little more interesting, and a little bit more varied as well. And it was completely compatible with the Lush Grass and Lush Trees mod that I also covered in that video. And those are mods that basically just make the grass and the trees a little bit more voluminous. Um, they're a little taller, they have a little thicker foliage, and generally make the, the land look a little bit more vibrant. And with these mods installed, you just began to get that feeling that your, your game was something, just like a little step beyond Ultra. Um, it, really, it really came home to you that your game was modded. If you looked at the game with all these mods running and then removed them and tried to play vanilla, it just was not the same. Now, part 15 was actually the first video I released after the creation kit. The creation kit came out um, the, like the first week of February and this video came out just after it. Uh, but it covered two mods, two very, very good mods that had actually already been made way before. So these mods had actually been made without the creation kit as well. And the mods in question were the PISE, the PISA, I think it said, mod and Deadly Dragons. Now, Pisa was just a mod that made the game harder, generally. It improved the AI, it, it made the barter, the vendors, a little bit more difficult. They charged higher prices for things and gave you less money for things. And all in all, just made the game a little bit more hardcore and a little bit more interesting if you were, you know, if you were a fairly, if you were a sort of skilled player who found the game too easy even at Master. Um, this was a very good mod, and I played with this for quite some time. Now, there is actually a new version of the mod called Assis. Um, so, PSAT itself has actually been discontinued. Assis seems to be pretty, um, pretty popular. It's not quite as popular as some of the other overhaul mods, but it's still definitely one that looks worthy of checking out. And as I mentioned, the second mod was Deadly Dragons. Now, this is a hugely popular mod, and rightfully so. This was, this was the mod that basically pointed out what I think a lot of people realized but hadn't sort of vocalized. Um, dragons are disappointingly easy to kill in Skyrim. I mean, dragons are supposed to be tough. Let's face it, they're supposed to have dominated um, the land once upon a time. They herald the end of time. They're supposed to be big, bad, boss-type monsters. Now, they are the signature creature of Skyrim, and yet they were really easy to kill. I mean, you, you, could, find, you could find wizards that would one-shot you, but a dragon couldn't kill you through, you know, half an hour of blasting you. It's just very easy to resist their damage and very easy to kill them pretty quickly. I mean, obviously, if you're only level 5 and you're going out killing ancient dragons, it's not going to happen. But... I mean, this mod approached it with the attitude of you should be level 50 and still find dragons to be a challenge. I mean, they are dragons, for God's sake. They're supposed to be tough. And you shouldn't be finding three or four white run guards killing a dragon. Dragons should terrorize entire cities. It should take a special type of um, player, a special type of hero. The Dragonborn, but you know, he needs to be a high level Dragonborn with and use all of his skills and cunning. And this mod achieved that, and it did it by making the dragons tougher, gave them extra abilities. Um, and just in general, if you play with this mod, when a dragon comes, you know, let's face it, in the vanilla game, when you hear the dragon, the first thing you think is, Ooh, a free dragon soul. It is, and oh, and dragon bones. That's what you're thinking. You're thinking free loot. Um, with Deadly Dragons, you're thinking, oh, oh my god, or I better go kill it, 
because I have to kill it, I suppose. I'm a Dragon Slayer, but my god, this is going to be a tough fight. So, still a great mod. Uh, still one of the sort of must-have essentials, I think. And so we move on to part 16. Now, part 16, obviously, was released in a post-creation kit world. And so I did what a lot of people who now know me well would expect and cover a bunch of mods that didn't actually require the creation kit. I decided to cover a lot of armor retextures. Uh, now, I hadn't actually done this before, so there you go. I'm doing everything backwards, I guess. But there was a reason for it. I was uh, doing a new playthrough and was looking for light armor for my... I had, was playing a mystical warrior, a warrior who used sword board, light armor, and spells. And I covered five mods, actually. And they were the Elven Armor Retextured mod, the Black Elven Armor and Weapons mod, um, and, oh, there was also the Mystic Elven Armor, if, if any of you remember that one, the Mystic Elven Armor HD. And so that was three mods that um, retextured Elven Armor. And they're very good, and if you want to see them, check out that, um, that video they're well worth checking out. Although I have to tell you now, personally at the moment, my favorite Elven armor is the Amidian Born. So currently that's the one I'm, I'm using. I think the Amidian Born textures are absolutely amazing. But there were two other mods I covered in, in that uh, video. The first one, well, I think it was actually the last one, but I'm going to talk about that first, was the better fitting glass helmet. Because one of the things about the glass helmet in Skyrim is it's built obviously to fit orcs and beast races and when you stick it on something like an elf, dark elf, um, the helmet is so wide it makes your head look like a square block. So this was a mod that basically made the helmet look far nicer um, and that was that was brilliant because I loved the look of, of that helmet. Um, and the other mod was the BGM Glass and Elven Armor and Weapons. And this was a retexture of the Elven and Glass Armors. Now, the, the Elven retexture, it was, it was good, but the reason I liked this mod was for the Glass Armor. The retexture of the Glass Armor is superb. Um, it's just very high definition. The color scheme is just... It's, it works. For me, it works. It's a lot darker. It's a lot more serious looking. I always found the glass armor in Skyrim to be a tiny bit comical. It was too bright, too light, and somehow looked fake, almost plasticky. Whereas this, it looked like some sort of magical ceramic armor with, with a lot of metal on it as well. This is, this is an armor retex that I will come back to any time I'm playing a character with glass armor. This is the retext that I will come back to. And part 17. Now part 17 was called Into the Mix for a good reason. It was just a mix of mods that had got my attention that week. Um, the first mod was the Kill Move Plus mod. And this was a mod that enhanced the kill moves, gives you different different number of kill moves, kill moves that weren't originally in the game, etc. Um, however, that mod is now hidden. There are, of course, other mods that do the same. You can find them on Nexus. So, you know, I'm not sure why it's hidden, but there are alternatives. The second mod was auto-equip arrows, and this was a sort of little hidden gem for me, um, in that it was one of the things that always annoyed me, was whenever I switched to bow, you'd get your arrows popping up, and then you'd switch back to your sword, and your arrows would stay there. And if that was the look you were going for, that was great, but I, I was playing a duelist, one-handed sword, um, and wanted to have no arrows sticking out my back. I wanted the sort of the swordsman look and I only ever drew my bow to, to get a dragon down, to get him down on the ground, to get his attention. Um, so I was constantly having to go back and unequip the damn things so they didn't ruin my screenshots. I know, I know, I'm worried about things like that. A lot of people aren't, but hey. Um, and of course there are actually mods that do the opposite of this and actually leave every weapon you use on and that's a different look. And to be honest, I think my next character is going to go for that look. But this one, I wanted no arrows. Um, so this was a godsend mod for me. Masters of Death, Rise of the Brotherhood. Now this was a good set of armor. This is very, very Assassin's Creed, um, but it had a set of armor called the Sicarius armor, and it also had a version of it for the Brotherhood. And it, you know, if you're playing the Brotherhood 
um, assassin. I mean, for me, the, the vanilla armor is appalling. I mean, I, I hate it. It's not so bad on the female characters, but on the male characters, it just looks terrible. In my, that was my opinion. I know some people might like it, but it, I, um, so this mod, definitely, I'm a big fan of this one. And the fourth mod was the Static Mesh Improvement mod. Um, and this is a great mod. And it's one of the few mods out there that tries to improve the models of basically everyday objects. Tables, chairs, cupboards, and so on. And, I mean, because, I mean, you get a lot of things improving textures. You get a lot of mods that improve the models on very specific things like weapons or armor. But... You know, it doesn't sound very sexy, does it? You know, I've made a better looking chair or a better looking wardrobe. But this mod does make those objects look a lot better. Um, and the mod author does have a very entertaining video as well. So that's one to check out. And still useful today. Still a must have for me. And that was it for part 17. And in some ways, part 17 marks the end of a chapter in the story that is Skyrim's modding. Because, as you're going to see in part 3, with the advent of the creation kit and the Steam Workshop, we were going to get some serious hard-hitting mods, some great mods, and, as you'll find out, more than a little controversy.